You're watching The Semi-Philosopher and I want to show you the ancient connection between Solomon and the Nephilim. Now, there's a lot of detail and if I just go over it without reading it through, I'm going to ramble and it's going to be a lot longer than it needs to be. So instead, I'm going to read right off the page. You'll get all the details. Um, visually, it won't be as exciting. Uh, but we'll get through it a lot quicker. So let's do this, right? Here we go. Um, I'm going to confirm some of the things that you believe, and I might challenge some of the things you believe. For those of you who have no idea what the Nephilim actually is, that's okay too. Hang in there with me. Before I get started, I want to introduce you to three tools that I'm going to be using. The Hebrew English Dictionary. Now you can use the one online that will work for you, but paper is cooler. It's visceral, it's tactile, mm, old school. Next is local context. I'll be showing you Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. The verses before that and after that, that's the local context. Every now and then, we use verses without being aware of what the local context is, and sometimes we get some weird ideas out there. Uh, if you're going to use a verse, be aware of the local context and use that verse correctly. Same goes for me. The third tool is biblical context. I'm going to be doing a deep dive into three terms found in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. And what these are, are these terms found in other places in the Bible? And if they are, what is the local context of each of those verses? Now you know what biblical context is. Some people refer to that as scripture interpreting scripture. That, that's a good habit. It's also my favorite way to study the Bible. Once you get the hang of it, the Bible becomes an infinite treasure hunt. Now, let's get into actual scripture. Uh, if you haven't turned to there already, Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. Hmm. There, it shouldn't sound suspicious. It shouldn't sound inexplicable, but it has a different connotation to it. It, it, it sounds a little weird, right? So the three terms we're going to be looking at is Nephilim, sons of God, and daughters of men. So the commonly held view, I'm going to pause right there. Uh, let me explain that by commonly held view, I am referring to my brothers and sisters in Christ whose fruit I respect, whose walks with God I respect, whose sermons I download and listen to. These are people that I worship with. These are people that I'll be in heaven with. So when I say commonly held view, that's not derogatory. It's not my clever way of being rude without being rude. Uh, commonly held you, just a statistical reference. Fair? Okay. The commonly held view is that the Nephilim, plus sons of God, plus daughters of men, equals rebellious angels going to human women to make babies who were so evil that God had to destroy the world to get rid of them. Now, there's other tangential uh, concepts associated with this core interpretation. I want to use scripture to show you that the common view is not correct on any point. That's really bold. I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm not trying to be hyperbolic. Uh, Genesis chapter 6 verse 4, along with the entire rest of the Bible, deserves to be part of our church services on a consistent basis. Uh, not every Sunday probably, but you know, something that we're not nervous about, we're not scared about, uh, something that we see the value of. So that's what this is. This is uh, a little bit of fine tuning, maybe, on our theology. And uh, hopefully, and it's also why I'm explaining how I get there. Because uh, I could give you the final result, but if I explain how I got there, then you're going to see some really good habits that can be applied to other things also. Okay. So here we go. Here we go. Uh, the first term is Nephilim. It's the name of a specific people group in history. 
documented for us by the book of Genesis. Thank you, Genesis. The Hebrew English Dictionary tells us that the name means men of renown, giants, and it has the connotation of the fallen ones. Basically means all the things already mentioned in Genesis chapter six, verse four. The term Nephilim, it is used one other place in the Bible. The Israelites, the scouts, were frightened by an enemy that they were tasked with facing and they used hyperbole to describe an enemy that they thought they could not defeat. The second term is sons of God. This is a title of belonging. Say it with me. Title of belonging. One more time. Title of belonging. Very good. Thank you. Uh, this is exciting because all through history and before it, God has called persons to himself. He's offered, will you love me? Will you obey me? Will you worship me alone? And for people who have answered, yes, we will love you. Yes, we will obey you. Yes, we will worship you alone. God has bestowed the title sons of God. The cool thing about this title is that it was also offered to angels. They had the opportunity to choose that they would love God, that they would obey God, that they would worship him alone. Two thirds of the angels said, yes, we will love you. Yes, we will obey you. Yes, we will worship you alone. That's exciting. I do want to take just a second to clarify that sons of God is not the equivalent to co-heirs with Christ. Does that make sense? That's a different study though. I've got notes to stick to, let's do that. So, is this term used in other places in the Bible? Uh, it's used in lots of places in the Bible. Sons of God is used, children of God, nation of God, places where God says, I am your father, you are my son. We'll look at some of those references. So. Yes, and in nearly every reference, it's speaking of humans. So statistically, in Genesis chapter six, verse four, when it says the sons of God went to the daughters of men, it's humans, humans. But that's not how we interpret scripture, is it? We don't interpret scripture statistically. We interpret scripture in context, local context, biblical context. Because in the book of Job, sons of God is used twice, that term, uh, both times for angels, right? So linguistically, could Genesis be saying sons of God, angels, went to daughters of men, humans, and had children by them? Linguistically, yes, that could be true. Contextually, statistically, for what it's worth, it's not true. Let's get back to the notes. Um, so there are places in the book of Job that the term sons of God is used to describe angels. And we know that because of the local context. Uh, in the book of Job, the setting is obviously celestial. In chapter 39, it even speaks of a time prior to humans being created. So that local context shows us that sons of God in that con local context means angels. However, the first part of Genesis speaks of the creation of the earth and humans. Um, the chapter right before chapter six, that's a lineage of sons of God. The passages following our text showed the destruction of the earth and of humans. So Genesis chapter six, verse four is sandwiched between references, references of the physical world being created and destroyed and references of humans being created and destroyed. In this text, sons of God means humans. That clarifies quite a bit. This is where the mood of the discussion shifts dramatically. This innocuous, often avoided verse is a heartbreaking obituary. It's the tragic end of a very long line of sons of God. And this obituary highlights the cause of their demise. Let's look now at the third term, daughters of men. This is another tragedy. The term 
of belonging is given to a specific group of women that God had called. But their answer was, no, we will not love you. We will love ourselves. No, we will not obey you. We won't obey anybody. No, we will not worship you alone. We'll worship anything except for you. They certainly aren't the first people group to make this exclamation, but it always saddens me when it's expressed. The Nephilim were human dads and human moms who had human children. These children grew up to be human dads and human moms who had children, etc. The historical Nephilim were not interdimensional crossbreeds. They were interfaith crossbreeds. Let me say that one more time. The Nephilim were not interdimensional crossbreeds. They were interfaith crossbreeds. Mm. So let me tell you about the ancient connection between Solomon and the Nephilim. The Bible tells us that God called Solomon his son. Solomon was absolutely a son of God. He began so humble and so strong that God chose to make him the wisest man in the world and the richest man in the world of his time, possibly ever. But then, but then, Solomon saw the daughters of men. They didn't act like the daughters of God. They didn't talk like the daughters of God. They didn't dress like the daughters of God. Solomon began to rationalize his thoughts and his actions followed soon after. He went on to take a thousand wives and with each one of those unions came all the interfaith baggage that crippled Solomon and destroyed his kingdom. The book of Ecclesiastes is Solomon's memoir, but it doesn't read like an inspirational podcast or a self-help book. It sounds a lot more like history's longest apology letter. What about Samson? He was the strongest man in history, and he was tasked with being a hero to rescue the children of Israel. But he saw a daughter of man. He didn't even bother to marry her. She didn't act like the daughters of God. She didn't sound like the daughters of God. She didn't dress like the daughters of God. Samson was personally ruined and Israel was cheated out of somebody who was supposed to be helping them. So why is this video so important? What life application should we be taking away? Firstly, we don't have to be frightened of half-demon, half-human evildoers that are destroying the world. Secondly, um, it needs to sober us that the Genesis Flood was necessitated by the sins of mankind. The sin had reached such a level that there was only one righteous household left on the entire planet. Warnings were given, escape was offered, but the rebellion was even more overwhelming than the Flood and humanity was nearly destroyed. Sadly, right after having been rescued, Noah's daughters lost sight of God and chose not to obey him alone. The result is the Ammonites and Midianites that terrorized God's people for hundreds of years. Two more points. Perhaps you've noticed that sometimes the Bible uses masculine program, uh, pronouns intentionally. This is not because men are better, but I think one reason is that men are created with the responsibility to choose to follow the direction of God and to lead those who are in their care in that same direction. Women can also be leaders. I know of several who lead boldly and humbly with integrity. I admire them for that. But wouldn't it be better if men did what we were made for and women didn't have to cover for us? I'm gonna say this to all the dudes and myself. Dudes, let's not be Nephilim. Lastly, I wanna express my gratitude to the daughters of God, young and old. You don't act like daughters of men. You don't sound like daughters of men. You don't dress like daughters of men. There's no way to establish a legacy and a lineage of sons of God without extraordinary daughters. Thanks for watching this in my philosophy. May God's peace have you.